Okay, um, let's start with the, with the next segment and this time we won't have so much time. So we will have the five minute clocks going down and, um, and I will be more a dictator again. But okay, so as said before, the, this segment is about build. So we of course can also talk about the runtime a little bit because the runtime is of course very necessary for building stuff. And uh, so we need to talk about this. Um, but please do not talk too much about distribute and do not talk about orchestrate. Um, <laughs> you said you needed some help during build. Do you need my help right now or not? No, it's fine, I think. Yeah, no, it's fine. And yeah, first speaker is uh, Akahiro again, talking about rootless build. And the microphone is here. And for the speakers, if you stay behind the, this one here, then the, the video is recorded best. So please try to stay here. No, don't go here because there's no camera coverage. Camera coverage is only here. OK, cool. And I start the clock. Hello again. Uh, I'm Aki Hiros. Uh, uh, I'm a manager of uh, BuildKit pro build project. Uh, BuildKit is a modern implementation of uh, Docker build uh, with focus on performance and security. Uh, so it can uh, analyze uh, dependency across uh, Dockerfile instructions accurately uh, because uh, BuildKit can uh, transform uh, Dockerfile to uh, LLB, uh, low-level uh, building format, uh, which is uh, similar to LLVM uh, intermediate representation, but it's for uh, Dockerfiles. And uh, with BuildKit, we can also execute uh, independent uh, Dockerfile instructions in parallel. And BuildKit has a bunch of uh, modern features, uh, such as uh, cache mount, uh, which can accelerate uh, builds uh, up to uh, 33 times faster. And also it supports uh, injecting uh, secret files, uh, such as uh, SSH credential or uh, uh, Amazon S3 credential uh, into uh, build containers uh, without uh, leaking uh, secret files into the final output image. <coughs> and also, uh, BuildKit has support for uh, new format that is different from Docker files, uh, such as uh, build packs. And we also support uh, Mocha file, uh, which is uh, similar to Docker file, but it's written in YAML format. It should be also easy to support uh, new formats, such as uh, Singularity build file. And the build kit has been integrated to Docker since uh, version 18.06, and you can enable build kit by setting an uh, environment variable called uh, Docker underscore build kit. But you don't necessarily need to use Docker for uh, using uh, build kit. Uh, so there's a standard version of uh, build kit. Uh, so it should work with uh, Portman and Cloud as well. And also it should work with uh, any container such as uh, Singularity or Charlie Cloud or whatever. And uh, BuildKit uh, doesn't need uh, root privileges. Uh, so we can uh, use uh, username spaces for executing uh, Dockerfile run instructions. And inside user username space, uh, you can gain the fake root privileges. Uh, so you can uh, execute uh, apt-get or yum or any uh, package manager uh, that typically needs uh, root uh, without real root. And the build kit uh, can produce, uh, of course, Docker image archive and also OCI image archive or uh, just uh, raw uh, classic turbo. Uh, so the output image is uh, compatible with uh, whatever. Uh, so you can, of course, use Docker. You can also use Portman. You can use, use uh, Singularity, uh, Charlie Cloud, or whatever. And you can also execute uh, build kit uh, inside uh, container. Uh, this is uh, good for. Uh, CI, CD, uh, or Kubernetes. And for Kubernetes, uh, you don't need to tweak the security conditions configuration. But at least uh, you need to uh, disable SecComp and Alpharmer because uh, BuildKit needs to uh, nest the containers on the top of the BuildKit container. And there's also a very similar project called Kaniko uh, by Google. Kaniko is uh, similar to BuildKit, but uh, Kaniko runs as the uh, root uh, in the container. Uh, 
but uh, Kaniko is unprivileged. Uh, that means uh, you don't need to disable SIGCOMP and RPAMRA for uh, Kaniko container uh, because uh, Kaniko doesn't need to do, uh, nest uh, containers on the top of the Kaniko container itself. Uh, so uh, Kaniko might be able to uh, mitigate uh, some vulnerabilities that bootless ability cannot mitigate, and actually vice versa. Uh, so uh, build kit uh, might be uh, weak against some uh, kernel vulnerabilities uh, related to uh, username spaces, and uh, Kaniko could uh, mitigate such kernel vulnerabilities. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, Kaniko uh, might be weak against uh, runcy uh, vulnerabilities, uh, which could be uh, mitigated by uh, rootless uh, build kit. That is the uh, difference. Yeah, that's all of, of my talk. Perfect. Okay. Next up, we have Valentin again. Hi, it's me again. So now I'm gonna gonna be talking about Builder. Um, it has a funny name because the architect in the team, Dan Walsh, he is based in Boston and he has a very strong Boston accent. And when he told the team a few years ago that it should be rather trivial or uh, doable to implement a tool that is specialized in building container images, he said, uh, call it something like Builder. And <laughs> there, there he goes. Ah, den host kann ich nicht laden. Das ist Mikro aus. Um, all right. Um, so Builder is a tool for building container images. Uh, parts of its code, uh, I've mentioned it in the previous talk already, is uh, vendored into Podman Build to s support building Docker files. But Builder's features go way beyond that. So there is a uh, compatibility to uh, also eat uh, Docker files, but it's meant to be used as a low levels core utils like package for building images. So the idea of Builder is that it can be used and interface to by other tools. As Podman, it resides on the github.com containers projects and it shares with the other tools also the image and storage libraries. So I guess I'm getting a, li a little bit redundant here. It supports Docker files but the Docker files are a bit extended. So something that users have been asking for many, many years is to have some kind of composability of Docker files. So you can compare it to including another Docker file just to avoid boilerplate code, to avoid redundancy, and all these things. Parts of it can be solved by multi-stage builds, but not every um, image should have or wants to have the same base images, things like that. So it's extended to support the include directive. We basically throw the C preprocessor at it when a Docker file has the suffix dot .in. Um, builder or builder uh, can compile Docker files with the build using Docker file um, command or just short bud. It runs useless. It has a similar, nearly the same architecture as Podman, daemonless architecture. For building containers, uh, container images, the containers themselves don't need to have a very strict isolation. So we lose a little bit security here, but it's only meant to be uh, creating images. It's also easy to integrate into Kubernetes pipelines. First, because it's a simple tool. It's just a process. You start. It can run rootless. And there are also official images that can be downloaded from Quay. There are also images for Podman and Scopio, but the ones for Builder I find most, most interesting because it's a very common use case. So quite often the question comes up, does Builder have a scripting language, perhaps Builder file? And Dan tends to joke, yes, it's called Bash. So the ultimate scripting language of 
builder is what's already on the host. As I said before, it should be used as any kind or just as a low-level interface to do whatever you want to do. It's very unopinionated if, if you want to. So an example can be we create a new build container with builder from scratch. So we create a new image which is basically empty just as we could do with Docker in a Docker file with from scratch. Then we mount the build container. I was mentioning that in a previous uh, talk before, that we can mount the root file system of the container on the host. And then we can manipulate things there. We can do a DNF install and install any kind of packages. There is no base image. We just put our stuff there. And well, we can do anything we want. Uh, inside there. It's just to illustrate how it can be used in the end. After a builder unmount, so we unmount the root file system from the host again to not leak any mounts, and then we can commit it and have a new image. This is basically how, or a very short example of how we can use builder to create images. Similar to Docker, we have the project upstream containers builder. We have a builder channel on Freenode. Feel free to join. There's also, I guess since Monday, a dedicated mailing list, builder at listsbuilder.io. Builder.io, you can find um, the website there. It's mostly mostly blogs or links to, to blogs on different resources, maybe the Red Hat blog, the SUSE blog, um, opensource.com, yada, yada. The demos can also be found there. And just as Podman, it's available on most Linux distributions, RHEL, Fedora, OpenSUSE, Manjaro, Gen2, Arch Linux, Ubuntu, and also Debian. With the, the Debian packaging, I still have a minute no. or so, no? Oh, OK, then i talk later about the Debian packaging, <laughs> because this was <laughs> a really big adventure. Thanks. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Valentin. And I just st stand up and sit there, so that's the the trigger that your time is up then, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick. Um, yeah, I only want to actually really touch on a few things. So. Can we turn the mic? Better? Yeah. Much better, probably. Okay, I'll be quick. I only want to talk about a few things with the Singularity build system. Um, the one thing you know that we're really doing that's that's kind of cool that that people really like is that you can directly download things from Docker Hub and turn it directly into a uh, Singularity image format. Um, I think actually I have slides talking about this during the distribution. Maybe I should have switched the order in which I'm I'm talking about these things. Um, but yeah, so you can you can download directly your Docker images and convert them right into a Singularity image. Uh, you can also directly execute a Docker image. So at that example in the bottom there, you can just run like Singularity exec and then give it your Docker image. And, and under the hood, it will be downloaded and then cached as a SquashFS uh, object on the disk. Uh, so it's kind of similar to what Shifter's been doing with the image gateway service, it's sort of along that line, I would, I would say. Um, yeah, so we also use Bash, right? We don't have a, a Docker file syntax. Um, some people have asked us, hey, can you support Docker file as well? We don't really support that right now. I mean, my, my response would be just go to, you know, build it in Docker and then just use the Docker image itself if you really want to use the Docker file syntax. Uh, otherwise, you can do pretty much anything that you need to do with, with just shell script, like, you know, run your app git install or your yum install or whatever it might be. Um, oh. Yeah, and then the other thing that, that's actually relatively new in Singularity, this is just released um, two months ago, I think. Ian, correct? Two months ago? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Two months ago, this was released. It's multi-stage build support. So uh, it was one of the things with the Docker file syntax that was really cool that, that we weren't doing, uh, where you could you know build an image and then build a second image and take artifacts from the first image all wrapped up into one uh, you know file. So, so this is actually supposed to all be one file. I just ran out of space. So it's, it's a <coughs> left side, and then the right side is a continuation of the file. Um, and then in the August time frame, we're also going to be introducing encrypted containers. Um, and so we're going to be introducing a way to build an encrypted container and then uh, you know, generate the or create the passphrase rather for that or the key or, or you know, however that's going to look. Um, but I'm not fully sure what that'll look like yet, so I can't, I can't really talk about the specifics of 
how that's going to happen, but expect encrypted containers in like August. That's all I have. Awesome. So I can steal the two minutes of you. Oh. <laughs> now, and it will start the timer for me as well, so I'm not as dictatorish. Okay, so I would like to talk about, and I, I, this is kind of what I would like to talk about here in this section is that if you have um, different images you want to use for different hardware types, and this is an example from BCG here, from Boston Consulting Group, from DockerCon last year, where they showed off how they built their MI and uh, AI images, ML and AI images, and they use different base images um, and couple this with different domain templates, so they have reinforcement learning, computer vision, and so on. This is the second bar there. And then uh, on top they install some frameworks like TensorFlow uh, or Kaffee or PyTorch, what have you. And uh, to make use of those frameworks, they use Jupyter for interactive figuring out what the data is and how you want to create your, your model on how, you how the, the code should look like. Once this is done, of course, you need to train the image or the train the model with a lot of data. So with a lot of cat and dog pictures, so you might use batch systems to um, train the data at the end. And once the model is, uh, is finished, you need to inference the model on an API or maybe on an edge node somewhere. So that's, uh, s this is the last step and that's also a different step from the two previous steps. And here, if I have different GPUs with different CUDA requ uh, requirements, I need to come up with three different images basically, right? I have one image if, and this is an if, if I don't use um, the hook stuff that we talked about in the runtime section where we gen map in the driver uh, from the host and pray, and I think that's it, it works quite well that the binary compatibility is there, that you can map in different um, drivers from below and, uh, and have it run. But since, I s uh, as I said before, I'm a purist in a sense, so I would like this to be part of the image, and this is something that we can like, discuss later. Um, I think that would be worthwhile to have this. And if we do so, we need to come up with different names for different base images, and this naming has to carry up uh, the, whole, the whole chain. And of course, that's due to the host agnostic um, idea of containers in general. They are kernel level, have kernel level isolation, so they don't know on what specific CPUs they are running. A container is only downloaded for an architecture, not for a microarchitecture, and you download this, um, yeah, this, this architecture piece and not the microarchitecture piece. Docker, for instance, they depend on the GoArc environment vari uh, variable um, to figure out what architecture they are running on, and then they use the GoOS uh, variable to figure out what, what um, operating system version is used. That's the OCI image spec, basically. And of course, we cannot differentiate between mi microarchitectures. And that's what was talked about earlier as well. So one way of building a container here is creating an image that is generic and can be used with any x86 system. So maybe it goes down to Pentium 3 or whatever, so that it can run on all the different uh, variants of a CPU. Or, uh, and this was what CJ was talking about, um, that you use either an entry point that figures out, okay, I'm on host, uh, on this host, I have this GPU, I need this CUDA version, and then um, maps it in and, and goes to different execution paths within the binary. Or you have one fat binary with a lot of uh, execution paths, and then you can um, run different, different uh, instruction sets on the CPU depending on where you are at. That's how it looks like in the, the ugly way, and we will talk about this again in the distribution piece, but uh, if you will rely on naming, of course, you need to yeah, know the name of the uh, image you want to run, and this, of course, is a little bit cumbersome. And maybe, since I have a minute left, um, one thing that we talked about a little bit, but I would like to make explicit is that if you use, for instance, Docker build, you cannot really built in a privileged environment because Docker, there's no such thing than Docker build privileged, right? <laughs> so you either need to patch the Docker daemon, which I did, so that I have privileged containers also when I build stuff. Otherwise, I won't have access to the devices, so I won't have access to NVIDIA devices, for instance, or, or any other uh, devices. And I think that's something that needs to be also discussed and talked about, how we can build in an environment that is still safe, but you can make sure that you can take advantage of the um, of the hardware that's under underneath. And this is, of course, what Singularity build and uh, others do as well, or Podman, that you just build it as a user land container. You don't need this, um, yeah, you don't need to, to pass privilege because it's also 
what is possible on the runtime as well. Okay, cool. CJ. Thanks. I'm going to talk next about something that we found to be particularly useful just at a really practical level in helping to build containers. Stay behind the oh, yes. How wide does it go? All right, great. Can't walk around? Okay, so I don't think there's any need for this audience to motivate people on using containers. Um, but when I started, first started looking at this, I gathered a bunch of usage models, and I found that there was a lot of kinds of things that I'd never thought of before that I hadn't anticipated. So if you're ever interested, I have more uh, content on those. So uh, how many people have uh, handwritten a Docker or Singularity file? Okay, and uh, think back to the first time that you did that, and think about your experience of even trying to do something with OpenMPI. Um, you know, which ver which way are you going to add MPI to your container? So, uh, if you look at this, you can. There are lots of different versions of this that you can use. Uh, there are param different parameters that you can pass to a configure. You may wish to control the environment uh, that relates to MPI. Uh, you can do some things that are simple, um, but that uh, you may get a wrong version that, for example, isn't CUDA aware. Uh, you may have built this thing with a variety of different kinds of compilers, and you're free to do horrible things with respect to laboring, which will give, uh, layering, which will give you bloated container sizes. All of those things are wonderful options that are available to you. You may wish instead to be able to take a little bit more of a disciplined approach and enjoy the benefits from the broader community. So we're uh, essentially doing uh, an open source effort to collect and codify some of the best practices in this space. So we want to make recipe file collection easy and repeatable and modular and qualifiable. So we want to make it so that uh, somebody can go and essentially create a recipe for a recipe and have an infrastructure behind this that will, whenever there's an improvement to the best way to do something, uh, how many grad students are here? Okay. Really? Okay. Um, uh, I can't tell anymore how young somebody is to be a grad student. They all, maybe we all look, seem like they're the same age as me anymore. Okay, we have one at least. Um, so uh, we should be being embarrassed by smart grad students and come, who can come up with much better ways of doing things than we can, right, and, and give them opportunities for notoriety. And we also want to take things and make them as a reference that's available to drive collaboration so that we can have, you know, a stake in the ground and say, well, what do you think of doing it this way? Got a better way of doing it? Well, let's try it out. Let's have it a, a disciplined, common environment where we can come up with whatever the best way is of doing something. And let's do this also in a way that's neutral with respect to the different container implementations that we have. So uh, an available way of doing this is with Python and making uh, calls to primitives, of uh, building blocks. You're totally free to roll your own. It's an open source framework. You can uh, clone it, fork it, do whatever you want to with it. We found that uh, we have a quote here, basically, we probably wouldn't have even started using containers for HPC, as ridiculous as that sounds, um, if we hadn't had a tool like this. And this is what we're using uh, as NVIDIA in the NVIDIA GPU cloud that I talked about earlier. Uh, this codifies everything that we do on the HP side, HPC side. Unfortunately, we haven't convinced all the people on the DL side uh, to do this. And so um, I keep hearing complaints about ways some of the, the guys on the deep learning side are doing things. And they're like, yeah, that's, we solved that already. They just haven't started using this infrastructure we have. So uh, a way to think of this is, if you have a Python script that can go and put together what you want, you can just plus equals each of the different components that you want. If you don't want to over-specify it, if you just want an easy on-ramp, hey, what's the, what are people thinking? What are people using? Let's set a, a set of defaults for OpenMPI, and you'll get all of this code that's down there at the bottom for this. Or you can override any of the individual um, items that are on this uh, with whatever your favorite versions of those things. And some different examples are there at the bottom. 
So you could compare this to um, module load, and we were talking, joking some last night about sort of, yeah, hey, we could use modules to uh, build everything up. Um, or essentially, you can do a corresponding fashion that basically just uh, loads all these things uh, this way in building your application. So uh, we have a number of base recipes of things that you can start with, and uh, then some other recipes uh, that you can add on top of this to add dependencies, and then your recipe file. And we can uh, then spit out a Docker file or Singularity file, actually also a script to be able to do this. And that then you can use to go build your container image. So we're following best practices for these things. And again, we find lots of people are using this. So you can just do a pip install HPC and, and get this. So these are some of the examples of the recipes. Uh, and you can get sort of a cross product of all these different things. Um, some of the building blocks that are here and uh, uh, showing some of the new additions. Um, Scott McMillan, who was a colleague of mine that came over from uh, Intel, is just going crazy at adding these things. I'm approving all the things that he uh, puts in there. So, um, and I, I could pull up some download stats too. There are a lot of people uh, each week that are downloading this thing and using it. And uh, people are wondering, you know, hey, uh, we're basically part of our value added is that everything that's in here we've tested, made sure that all the versions work together. We built uh, versions of containers uh, with them, images, and they're posted on NGC, and we validated those on our hardware. Uh, we haven't done that for some other things that we don't have hardware for, like some of the power platforms. Um, we keep encouraging folks at ORNL and uh, Livermore and other places and IBM to kind of like, hey, why don't you go take and specialize in uh, one of these uh, for this? So there's basically this uh, procedure that you go through for building this, and you can uh, sort of start anywhere you want to along this uh, progression. There's some questions about what you could do for multi-node. I'll talk more this afternoon about some of the kinds of things we've done. Um, but we want to support a variety of different choices with resource management, parallel launch, um, and are essentially codifying. People say, well, how do you do multi-node containers? And our answer is, well, why don't you go look at some of the examples that we have, and you can go see what we do. Uh, go look at how the system will build it uh, when you say, you know, I want to uh, put all the stuff in there that I need for a multi-node container. And we found that uh, doing this with UCX, um, OpenMPI, and now uh, MPitch also is built on Open, uh, on UCX. Um, and so uh, you can, if you use, for example, the MoFed libraries with uh, 4.4 or later, they're already pre-enabled to use uh, UCX, and you'll pick up and get that. And that's one of the ways that we uh, provide the CUDAware MPI infrastructure, so that you'd be able to uh, do transfers with you know zero copies and do things more efficiently in this way. So just some summary uh, from some things with this. It simplifies the creation of a container specification file. Uh, you get the best practices that are used by default. Uh, we encourage you all to try it out and to say, hey, that's busted, uh, or hey, I want this feature. Uh, this would be really useful if I had this, uh, and add that into there. Um, and among the directions that we're headed with this are enabling things like uh, mashups, right? So many people who had traditionally done mod sim uh, are now saying, well, what happens if I want to solve part of my problem uh, using some deep learning techniques? So uh, we had some results uh, this week where somebody took HPL and applied deep learning to it and got the same answer three times faster uh, at scale on Summit. Um, so it doesn't follow the HPL rules anymore, but you know, kind of cool what you can do with that, right? Um, or if you want to do viz, right? We have a different way, a bunch of ways where you can just say, you know, plus equals. Um, uh, some of the visualization uh, tools like Paraview um, and other kinds of things to get those in there. So uh, this is essentially the direction we're um, moving with that, and uh, we'd love for you to try it. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. I forgot to, to start the timer, so you were lucky. Um, and now I'm starting again. OK. So um, as my name is Kulpo from MPFL, a Spark Core developer, and I'm probably going to talk to you um, how you could do things <coughs> slightly different than what has been just presented. Like instead of having all the recipes unrolled in your Docker file or Singularity file, just use a package manager that knows how to build things, and your call will just be 
a call to the package manager within your recipe. So what is SPAC? Very briefly, uh, SPAC is a multi-language package manager that builds from sources. And I would say that its main feature is that, that it can manage the extreme complexity that HPC brings in. So it can manage different configurations of software. Um, and it gives the users a DSL to talk about that. So what happens is that you can experiment, really, with every configuration um, you want to use. And SPAC will just take your constraints and fill in the blanks for all the other details. Uh, you can see, let's say, part of what we can do with our DSL. Uh, the two points here to note are that we can inject compiler flags into each node. So if you want to be sure that some specific flags are used, you can do that. And we already have the notion of a target. Uh, and we can already cross-compile for, let's say, high-end machines like Cray and BlueGenQ. How can we do that? We basically don't use directly the compiler. We just use a thin wrapper, and we intercept compiler's call. At that point, we can sanitize, manage the flags, reorder them, do whatever we need to do to ensure that things are working properly or like as the user specified. And that's what we can do right now. Uh, in the near future, there are the various work ongoing to improve on the support for target. Right now, we can target architectures, naming like x86, 64, PPC, and we are at that level of granularity because we rely on what Python provides by default. What we are working on, you will see the pull request there, is a finer uh, granularity where, where we can specify uh, the microarchitectures like Skylake, Ice Lake, Canon Lake, and we, uh, where we can also have a better auto detection uh, of the OST microarchitecture. The idea is that you could build at that point those optimized images Christian was talking about. If you say, I want to build something for target Skylake, you will be ensured that minus MR equals Skylake will be used at compile time. So there is another feature that is worth mentioning uh, as long as we are talking about building containers, which is Spark environments. So Spark environments are basically an extension of the concept of virtual environments that doesn't work just for Python, but for everything. Uh, and it works on the, let's say, on the model that Bundler started of a manifest file and a log file that tells you what you're going to what you're going to uh, build right now uh, during this, let's say, this particular configuration. Um, the idea is that you can have a configuration file, like the one on the left, where you specify what you want to build into your container. And then, when you build your container, that should be as easy as copying that configuration files that contains everything you need to know about your environment, and then just saying SPAC install. SPAC will look at that and will proceed accordingly. Um, another thing, you see that there is some sort of machinery to do the plumbing to have SPAC available, uh, but we have experimental SPAC containers for Docker and soon for Singularity, so there will be no need to, uh, to replicate the setup from one container to the other, you could just use some uh, SPAC base image. And finally, features and improvements that are being discussed right now in the community. Um, of course, closer integration with container technology to spit out recipes for Singularity or for Docker. Uh, one relevant thing is support for multi-stage builds uh, in the sense that at that point we could leave out any trace of SPAC in your final container and any trace of build dependent. Thanks, Masmiliano. And then you can sh just stay here because now we have the, the panel discussion.
So and all the other speakers, if you could join here as well, it would be awesome. And I think like directly uh, after this build segment, we have the distribution segment and they are closely coupled. So I guess we shouldn't spend maybe too much time on the panel here because we can incorporate the panel and at the distribution level as well. <laughs> I'll start with the first question. Yeah, of course. Um, the, CJ, you can help me on this one. Um, what do you do for products that are licensed? So, for example, some CUDA libraries may require a license, and the, the plus equals directive may need to pull that. How, how does that really work? Yeah, uh, so another example would be the Intel compiler. Sure. So the Intel ah, compiler damn. is one of the things we hear, but I don't think Intel would be terribly pleased if we uh, took our version with their license and distributed that for the world. CJ, can I stop you for... Okay, so the question was about what do you do with licenses and inside containers? And you can't take a, somebody else's license and distribute it with your container. That'd be the wrong thing to do. So uh, one of the things that uh, most packages, not all, uh, will allow you to do is to uh, essentially specify a path as to where the license is. Sometimes it needs to be in a particular exact place. And so uh, one of the things that you can do is to build a container uh, so that it will find that, or uh, as part of the process of loading it to figure out where it is on the host system and then set it appropriately. So one of the things that we do with instructions, uh, so, so if you can make the container do it completely autonomously, that's a win. Uh, in some cases you'll need the administrator to do something because only know, they know where something is and you from inside the container couldn't possibly find where something is. And so there are instructions that go with the uh, uh, container uh, that essentially are to the administrator of here's how you should run it at your locale and here are the things that you should fill in uh, in your particular environment uh, as you're invoking this. Can I can I also go in uh, just for in, in the friendliestness of uh, rebutting? Um, uh, there is, uh, I think that I showed on there, there's a way to build SPAC and include SPAC uh, as a package manager in HPC. Um, we think SPAC's great, not trying to compete with, you, with SPAC in any way. Um, one of the uh, observations that we have is that when you do something with a package manager, you tend to be configured for a particular target platform, and then that's not as portable, right? So we are making this so that you can run SPAC from inside uh, the container, uh, as produced by HBC and still end up with something that um, is uh, more retargetable in that way. So we can sort of take the best of both worlds of what SPAC can offer and HBC to do things together. Okay, uh, what I can say is that portability probably um, depends on what you put in that SPAC configuration file Absolutely. that that I've just shown. So if you configure to build portable recipes, saying something like target equal, generic or x86-64, uh, and you configure, I don't know, your open MPI or whatever could be tied to some particular environment to be overly generic at the expense, of course, of performance, uh, you could do that too with yeah, just bare spec. So I think there are two, uh, I would say there are two complementary tools. We would never begin to try and attempt to do all the things that you're doing with SPAC. You do a whole lot more breadth. Um, we also offer recipes, I think, uh, for doing things in a way that uh, can be complementary to what SPAC does as well. So let me think. I, the one thing I, maybe this, initially directed at CJ. So maybe one question I had is, do you know with the NVIDIA, like the CUDA compiler and stuff like that, um, you don't have to have a GPU on the system in order to have it generate code, correct? Or generate binaries? You must have the driver installed, but I'm pretty sure that you can do that on a system that doesn't actually have a card. Yeah. I think that one thing we could, we need more of that, I think, from the vendor community is, uh, is sort of abstract the build process. It's kind of like cross compilers taken to an extreme, right? And where you can just say like these, imagine I was on this set of target systems, produce 
code for that, you know, produce uh, binaries for that. And uh, that way, we can, if we're gonna move more towards these kind of build farms or something like that, we, there's gotta be cases where we have to maybe have the, the same core architecture, but we don't wanna necessarily have to have every variant of it or, you know, have uh, every GPU variant that we need or something like that, right? One practical example of that? Yeah. Do we, is there anybody here from uh, ORNL? Okay, so uh, Oak Ridge National Labs um, in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, one of the DOE labs uh, runs into this issue, and because they have essentially uh, power-based platforms, and uh, many of their login nodes are x86, and those are ones that are commonly used for building stuff, but if you want a container that's gonna go and need to run on it, there are some things that need to be on that platform when you do it, and they the way that their data centers set up you can't just you need allocation time to be able to get on one of those machines and you can't really use that for building so they have uh just recently created a builder service where it's just as if it's in the cloud that has appropriate resources behind it where you say hey here's the stuff i want to do could you on a native platform build the stuff that you need to do for that particular platform and give me back a container that i can then go um, put in a, a job scheduler and make rock yeah that's exactly i think you know we're going to need more of that as we but move this, forward this ties in a little bit to what michael said yeah. because because you you guys you you said that if once you build the singularity file right yeah. Once you build a single right file, then you, as, a, as an afterthought, you collect where you build it on because you assume that it was built natively and then you try to figure out what yeah. the native part is. And what you just said is more, we define it in the beginning. We say, okay, this is a target I want to, I wanted to build for and yeah. I don't need a and specific it's more thing. About because sometimes your build resources may not match all the different runtime environments that you want to be able to execute on. You know? mm. Yeah, so that's one of the things that, that we set out to solve. I mean, it's nice to think that we're going to get to an ideal world where, you know, every tool or hardware or whatever, you can compile it wherever and they're going to provide the right way to do that. Um, I don't think that's, I mean, it's just like, you know, it's a unicorn view. Um, so so that, that was a, a big problem. And so that's what the build service is intended to solve or help solve is so that you can set up, you know, a set of resources on your site specifically dedicated to building container images on the target platform that they're they're set to run from, um, and then you can just go and it looks like you're doing it in the cloud, um, but it but it's you know it's all happening on on the right platform. But isn't it a little bit like I wouldn't say overspending? But you you have a new system and you you have one build node that is dedicated to build new images, but this new system of course needs to run much more build jobs than the old system. So you have this bottleneck that you need to dedicate the actual host that you want to run on in order to make use of the best optimized yeah, image. Yeah, right? resource management. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay. So you could theoretically, I mean, you know, I don't know how, how we're exactly deploying it and managing that, right? But you could theoretically tie it in so that you're asking for partitions or, or whatever. Um, but it's providing the ability to go do that in an easy, convenient, comfortable way without having to go through the, the steps to, to like, manually try and figure out how to do that, right? But this is in, a, in the context of a site right, where you can yeah. portion up something. And if you are like, I create a startup and I want to create a tool that is highly optimized for certain architectures and I need to pre-compile the images in order to make it available for my customers because I cannot go to the customer and say, just give me one node for a day and I will create optimized images for you. So, and I know, I, I agree it's a unicorn view, but I like this unicorn view. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe to some extent, maybe we can have some, some pieces yeah. that we can like, like, like Massimilio says, uh, showed with, with the Skylake approach, that at mm -hmm. least we can like optimize for, maybe not for everything, but for the 80% of stuff that helps. So, so that's the, the cloud side of things that, that we're also building. So you know, theoretically, okay, right now it's all x86 instances when you're doing a remote build in the cloud through the, you know, the cloud website. Um, but we're also planning to potentially be spinning up, you know, ARM systems or power systems or, you know, that's what you could come and pay us to, to fix for you, basically, and do it in the cloud then. Yeah, but you need to spin up the instance that... I think that they need help from the tool chain providers too. They need, right. they need to help meet the middle. And uh, Shane, would uh, would a Docker in Docker kind of concept solve this problem? So if you created a Docker image for builds, th does that fix the problem? Again, it gets back to the tool chains and what they're 
assuming, and most of these are designed with the idea that like I'm going to run this tool chain on the target platform, and that's where it happens. Now, the the, the one thing that could help is these. Um, kind of rootless build tools, you could start to just say like, well, I'm just gonna make my, my first job is gonna be build the image and I'll run it directly on the, on the target system and then it kind of handles all that automatically, right? So um, maybe that's the other, you know, the other approach. So I think it's, I'm Good glad first. to see that we're starting to see some of these, uh, these tools get there. Uh, just one point of clarification, both Builda and Build kit, they do need this UID map, GID map stuff set up right now to run rootless. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, uh, correct. Uh, currently, you need uh, UID map, GID map. But uh, as I shown on the uh, runtime session, uh, there is uh, ongoing work to uh, support running uh, images uh, without sub UID and sub GID uh, by using uh, P trace yeah. and X attribute. Just for that performance uh, yeah. for now. I, it seems like for these, I, one thing that occurs to me is like when we're building images, at least for the HPC kind of context, you know, permissions and different ownerships within the image is like, why are we doing this? You know, it's, it's for the user that's going to run it, just make it flat, right? And a lot of these UID, GID maps is to kind of preserve that. And I wonder if we could just sort of have a model where we say like, just flatten it on, don't worry about it, because that's what we really, we either want the user to see it or don't bother putting it in the image, right? Is sort of how it would, it seems like it should be. Is yeah. that, maybe you want to offline write up what you think the issue is there, if you think that's something that we should nail down and collaborate on to establish a best practice around. It, and you it think maybe we it's need, something where we can push this back to. Is that really the responsibility of the uh, person who builds the container in terms of how they do that? I think it's something maybe that we want the the tool chains themselves, the build, mm -hmm. the image builders, to kind of just have as a a flag option to say like I don't want a different user this. I want it to get flattened. Right? Yeah, I mean that's what happens by default in Singularity is, is when you're um, so you do all the build process and you're doing that as your user or I mean with sudo right. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, we we when we're Doing the make squash FS, we just do it so that it's all UID as root and it's, you know. And I think that's what we're doing effectively too. It, it makes it just a lot simpler. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about weird mapping problems or, or whatever yeah. if you don't want to then. But for the for the POSIX file system within the container, the container file system itself, I come back to my argument that we should use read only images so that we don't care about well, what user it is and just make everything readable for any user within the container because. I this mean, is it's kind in of a the container, so of that, but you know, it, it may be that these tools are being used in other, you know, people are running containers for services and things like that too. But I wonder if we could just, I, I wonder if this is something everybody could kind of agree on, and it would actually simplify things a little bit. I mean, what do you do? You sort of get where I'm going with that? Yeah, I, I guess it's always the or finding a balance between generalization and specialization. Uh, certainly, we can make everything world readable and writable, and then you don't need set UID, for instance, because um, Portman and BuildKit they can always run with the same user ID, right? Then we you, you don't need to change that. That's that's certainly possible. Um, but this is a rather special special use case. Uh, I think it is and it isn't. I think that what's happened is all of these build tools inherited from classic Linux kind of environments, right? Where you're running on a multi-user system and that's the reason all these permissions exist, right? You need things to run as root or other daemon processes. And But if we're building a container, we're building it for typically for a specific application and we don't you know, if we don't need those things in there, we should just jot, put them in the image, right? So I'm just wondering if this is something that we need to sort of change our preconceived notions about some of the stuff, right? I, I like the idea. I'm, I'm not sure as far as how far vendors can push it because especially when it comes to rootless execution, there's just certain boundaries. There are limits of what can be executed because some things, maybe system D, for instance, needs root. Right. right. Yeah. But, but when it, it comes like to we need a usage system model D. then for all those different categories is when do you need what level of privilege? And if we as a community can agree on that or put up a straw man and get people to say, no, here's a counter example, then that, that moves the community along, right? I mean, I feel like so. I feel like there's a much larger, more broad conversation also going on here, which is that 
what we're working with in terms of privilege and permissions in the kernel right now is the worldview, I guess, when, you know, when Linux was being created. And we're going, I feel we're going in a direction that we need maybe a new paradigm in terms of like how we're thinking of multi-tenant permissions and privileges with the introduction of this containerization stuff. I think you see sort of that direction also with the UID and GID mapping stuff that's going on now. And I, I really feel like there's some next paradigm that's going to emerge from, from this containerization shift. And the user namespaces, I mean, the file I.O., if we could, and, and, and you showed it, uh, Akahiro, you showed it, that before you can use user namespaces, you have to specify which user ID should be mapped to what user ID outside. So you say, I have an offset of 100,000, and then user ID zero is user ID uh, 100,000. But if you have different user IDs, and for containers it's natural that the user can specify what is the user that's running inside of the container, if we could use a user namespace, and not possible, uh, not sure is it possible, but if we could tell the kernel, no matter what user is used within the container, the file IO is this user. Yeah. And then we can just use POSIX file system underneath and we, we, we have this one problem solved. But uh, but actually, uh, you don't need uh, sub UID and sub zero ID uh, when you just need a single user ID. <coughs> and uh, but a multiple user ID is uh, only required for uh, compatibility with the uh, uh, classic system uh, before mm -hmm. continuous. Uh, so, for example, AppleGate uh, requires a special user account uh, for running AppleGate itself. Uh, but uh, we can uh, modify some AppleGate configuration to run as a single user. And for other package managers, uh, YAM or uh, APK or whatever uh, can be just configured to run as a single user. And uh, for HPC applications, uh, uh, we can just use a single UID for everything. Uh, for, for So uh, if uh, we can uh, provide a very special Docker file, uh, we don't need some UID and some ZID at all. Uh, we don't need any hack for uh, counter runtimes, yeah. such as speed race. Yeah, cool. I think we should move on to the next segment, and and we can continue talking about build stuff in the next panel discussion as well because it's pretty. If we have two minutes, I would, <laughs> I would like to steal them. Yeah, I also wanted to add a question. <laughs> yeah. oh, damn. But can we can we put it? Could a pin in this and talk about it during the dis distribution panel? We we could, but Other it would perfectly fit fit Go here ahead. in the build. Thanks thanks a lot, and and sorry for for stealing the time. Uh, uh, no, uh, no. Just to chime in the conversation we had before, uh, when it comes to specializing uh, specializing builds and tailoring them to architectures and uh, let's say uh, all the different platforms we have. What I see in the containers ecosystem is that. A lot of things are just being repeated what distributions do for decades already. Um, so when we look at a, at a normal or common Linux dis distribution, it could be any. It's being offered for different kind of architectures, um, especially when it comes to ARM. Everything is so different, right? There's no one single ARM. I guess there's dozens of different ARM architectures or platforms in the end that are incompatible to a certain degree. So they need to comp be compiled in any case. And there are open source solutions already when we look, for instance, uh, to uh, at the open, open build service uh, from OpenSUSE and SUSE. This is something that already allows to build container images. There is a matrix that can be configured for ARM, S390, what, whatever we like. So in, in theory, those could be extended to support a little bit more than that, also different platforms, Skylake, yada, yada, um, and can just be, or could theoretically be, be reused. So uh, this is basically, uh, I'm not sure where I'm okay. going with it. I'm <laughs> just trying to say that looking at what already exists can be really, really helpful. For instance, all OpenSUSE images are built exactly like that. And the cool thing is there is already dependency management and resolution. So whenever a package dependency changes, maybe for instance GCC, well, the world must be recompiled, and this is exactly what happens there. But maybe to this point, the the, the thing that we see, I think, is that the non-HPC enterprise workloads they just don't care about this recompilation thing, right? Because they just download Nginx and they don't optimize Nginx for Skylake. And if we could, like maybe 
approach them and tell them, okay, you can get something cool from our side of optimization for certain hardware architectures and you have a zoo of hardware nowadays anyway. So maybe we can just lay out the bait and say, okay, look, we can optimize Nginx for you so that it's much more performant. That's something that's not really picked up in the non-HPC <laughs> world, or, right? And I think that we may be able to like draw them in by just putting out the bait and, and say we can help you yeah. with that and then maybe Th but I that's also I'm unicorn view here as a whole <laughs> oh, same from same from my <laughs> side I'm, I'm just <laughs> at the moment I'm blindly saying that's super easy to extend the metrics I have <laughs> I have no idea about the the difficulties in specializing the builds for HPC so I'm basically just trying to say that I see similarities in the problems right and in the end it's about how we can abstract the problems to make it apply to many use cases. Yeah. So, guys, let's move on to the next segment. Thanks uh, for this panel.